This video was suggested by Lucky Bart, one of the subscribers of this channel, and I'm really happy to see that you guys are enjoying those videos and you find them useful. And of course, if you want to see a video on a specific topic, just drop a comment below and your idea will be definitely considered. In this video, we're going to focus on four key aspects around Java collections that I find to be quite relevant for a wider audience. The role of this video is to get to know your tools better. In this case, the classes in the Java API that allow us to play with collections. And not only to know what those classes are, but also when they are best suited for a given use case. So in Java, collections are production-grade implementations for widely known data structures. And the main aspects that we should know about data structures, apart from what they actually are, is the complexities associated with each operation that we can execute on them, and also on which algorithms a data structure actually fits really well. Those two aspects actually influence directly the performance of our application. Now, when talking about data structures, we actually refer to arrays, linked lists, trees, and hash tables, or dictionaries, as they're called in other languages. Now in Java API, collections are implemented using a hierarchy of interfaces, abstract classes, and regular classes that allow us to extend this functionality for more advanced use cases. A relevant part of this hierarchy, which consists only on interfaces, looks like that, where we have the iterable as the base interface, extended by collection, and further extended by set, list, and queue interfaces. The main implementations for those last three interfaces are those ones, and we're going to take a look on each of them to actually understand why they were created in the first place. So we're going to start with one of the simplest collections out there, which is an array list. And the reason it's called an array list is because it uses an array to store the actual elements. And we know that when we declare an array, we have to specify a max number of elements that it can hold. In the case of an array list, we don't have to worry about hitting that limit because this array will actually grow as long as we add more elements into the array list. So we have some basic operations that we can execute on our array list, like adding elements, removing elements by specifying the actual element that we want to remove, or by specifying the index on which that element is positioned in the array. And it's very important to know that this remove operation actually takes big of n time complexity, because when we remove an element, there will be a gap in the array, which have to be filled with some other element. So all the elements up at the right of the element that's going to be removed will be shifted one position to the left. And worst case, we can actually shift all the elements in the array. So for that reason, this operation actually takes big of n time complexity. We also have other operations like contains to check if an element exists in the array, which also takes big of n time complexity because we have to check, worst case, all the elements in the array to return that result. And also other things like um, if the array is empty or not, or if you want to remove all the elements in the array, we have to use the clear method and other utility methods that, that you can check on the array list class. We should use an array list when we have scenarios that require random access to different elements because we can use the index of that element to, to get it in constant time, where we need memory efficiency because the elements in the array are stored in contiguous memory areas. So things like iterating over the elements or storing them in an efficient way are achieved by using an array to store them. And also for scenarios where we don't have so frequent remove operations because we hit that performance penalty that we just uh, mentioned previously. We also have the linked list as an alternative to an array list. And the main difference is that in a linked list, elements are stored as individual nodes spread into memory, and each node has a connection to the next and to the previous node. So we're able to traverse the list from the first and to the last node, and also in reverse. Of course, we can add elements and remove elements from that linked list using the index, but also the actual element that we want to remove. And it's also important to know that this remove operation actually takes constant time because we don't have to shift the elements left to one position as we do in the case of an array list. We just have to update the connections to the nodes around the one that's going to be removed and the consistency of the linked list will be maintained. Now, if we take a look on the definition of the linked list class, we can see that it implements this DEC interface, which stands for doubly ended queue, which means that a linked list provides us methods to add or remove elements from both ends of a queue. And the way we can use a linked list as a queue is by actually using the offer and poll methods of that class that allow us to add and remove elements from that queue. And actually a queue is basically a data structure that follows the first in first out model, meaning that the first element that we add into the queue will be the first one that's going to be removed. So if we run this code, we can see that the one, which is the first element that we added into the queue is the first one that gets 
removed. And even more interestingly, a linked list can also be used as a stack. So if we use the push and pop methods, we can basically add or remove elements from that stack. And the stack basically follows the last in first out model, which means that the last element that we add into the stack will be the first one that's going to be removed, which actually happens in this case with the element uh, three that gets removed first from the stack. Now, another important class that we should know about is priority queue. And as the name says, this class provides the functionality of a queue. So we got the same methods offer and poll to add or remove elements from that queue. But the main functionality of this class is that when we want to remove the elements, they are selected based on a priority. So if we run this code, we first get the value one and then the value four because the elements are retrieved in ascending order and their value dictates their priority. And this is a default behavior of that class for classical data types. If we have a more complex scenario where we want to store some more complex objects like user profiles, as you can see here, we need to tell the priority queue the criteria based on which we order the elements, which is the actual priority. And we do that by passing in the constructor an object that implements compatible interface. And in this case, we want to use the age field for that. And if we run the code, we can see that the first object retrieved is the one that has the age 20, which is the smallest. A priority queue is basically a heap data structure, and it's really useful when we want to efficiently get the next element in a collection, which follows a particular rule or criteria, because a heap takes log n time complexity for add or remove operations. Now, another really nice collection that can be found everywhere is HashMap which is basically a lookup table or a hash table. It stores data as key value pairs, which need to follow the generic types that are defined when we declare the hash map. The interesting part is the way the data gets stored in the background. When we call the put method, there's a hash function that gets applied on a key, which returns a hash result that defines the memory location where the value will be stored. When we want to retrieve the data, the same hash function is applied and returns the same result for the same key. So in that way, we reach the same memory location where the right value is stored. In terms of complexity, it takes constant time to add or retrieve data from a hash map. So it's a very efficient data structure because there are no loops involved in any of those operations. There are also scenarios where the performance can decrease, but this is probably a topic for another video. Now, of course, we have a number of convenient methods that allow us to check if a key or a value exists in the map to get all the keys or all the values and all the entries in a collection if we want to iterate on them for some reason. Now, it's important to know that when we want to iterate over the entries, their order is not guaranteed to be the order in which they were inserted in the map. And this is expected because the hash function doesn't provide that guarantee. If we have this kind of requirement, we need to use a linked hash map, which uses a linked list internally that preserves the insertion order of the elements in the map. Now, in the same maps category, we have a data structure which is not so popular in production grade systems, but heavily used under the hood by lots of applications, which is called the red black tree, implemented by a tree map in Java. The main functionality this data structure brings over a hash map is that it keeps the entries sorted by keys. So when we iterate over the entries, we get them sorted based on the natural order of the elements, if they are integers or strings, or based on a comparator that we can provide in the constructor. Because all operations have log n complexity in the worst case, we can efficiently get the next or the previous entry compared to a given key, which basically involves a search operation in that tree. This is a quite complex data structure. It involves some background operations to keep the tree balanced all the time. So to fully understand how it works, I recommend the wiki page on that topic, which is pretty accurate. Now, the last collections category we're going to talk about is called set. And it's very similar to a list. The only difference is that it doesn't allow duplicate elements. So if you try to add two identical elements into a set, only one of them will be kept. We have three set implementations which are based on the map equivalent. For example, a hash set uses a hash map in the background. So the uniqueness property is guaranteed by the fact that in a map, we cannot have duplicate keys. A linked hash set uses a linked list to ensure the insertion order of the elements. And the tree set uses a tree map in the background to ensure the uniqueness property and the elements are stored based on their natural ordering or based on a custom ordering logic that can be provided through a comparator. This is basically the main purpose we can use a tree set for. In Java Collections Framework, we have a couple of algorithms or utility functions that we can use to execute certain tasks. So let's say we have a list and we want to sort all the elements in ascending order. To do that, we just have to say collections.sort and we pass in the list. The algorithm is an efficient version of merge sort. If we want to search for an element in that list, for example, we have the binary search method for that. In order to work, the list has to be sorted before this method is called. It reduces the position on which the element is found or negative integer otherwise. We also have other utility methods that are not so complex like frequency method, which returns the number of times we have an element in the list, the maximum or the minimum methods, right, to get the corresponding element in the list, 
shuffle to rearrange the elements in the list in a random order, swap to interchange two elements based on their position, we have uh, fill to replace all the elements with the same value, and a couple of other methods that you can explore if you want. And not to mention, all those methods work as we expect. Now the last but probably the most important thing we should know about collections is that most of them, if not all of them, are not thread safe. This means that if the same collection is used by multiple threads and at least one of them is updating it, then our application may get unpredictable results. You need to always take a look on the class documentation to see if there is any mention around concurrency or synchronization like we see here. And when this happens, we need to ensure exclusive access to the collection using a synchronized block, a lock or any other synchronization tool. And this depends of course on the use case. A great tip around that is the collection class where we have some methods that take a collection and return a thread safe version of it. It basically wraps your collection into a synchronized collection and the synchronization happens inside it. In that way, you don't have to externally synchronize your collection as long as you use the one returned by one of those methods. So that was a short overview on Java collections. Let me know what you think in the comment section below and I'll see you in the next video.